Hello and welcome everyone. I'm Kevin Chrissy, part of the investor relations team at Sabre. I'm thrilled to have Andrew Watterson, Chief Commercial Officer from Southwest Airlines with me today. Welcome, Andrew. Thanks, Kevin. Glad to be here. Uh, before we get started, we have a lot to discuss today. I want to let everyone know, those watching, you can check out uh, the questions that we're covering uh, on the links below. Andrew, um, maybe you could start by talking about how Southwest is dealing with the COVID, how you've managed through the COVID crisis. It's obviously been the biggest uh, impact in the industry's history. Yeah, it, obviously we've had a lot of ups and downs with COVID. And so what we've been focused on is in the short term, managing our business in like 30, 60, 90 day chunks. We can understand where demand is and what the right level of capacity we need to deploy against that demand for you know, the best financial outcome with an eye towards getting to you know, cash burn break even, you know, as quickly as possible. Uh, at the same time, we had to, you know, uh, tamp down a lot of our expenses, discretionary expenses during this time, but we were keen to make sure we didn't kind of mortgage the future. So some of our kind of big uh, initiatives that we had undergoing, uh, we kept them going like our work with Sabre. Um, to, to what extent does corporate travel fit into to those plans? It seems, um, you know, difficult to position a corporate travel strategy into this type of pandemic. And that, that's true. The corporate travel demand is extraordinarily low right now, even though leisure is coming back uh, with, with gusto. The uh, uh, corporate travel initiative we had was pre-pandemic. And so if you go back, you know, we're almost 50 years old, uh, we will be next month. We started life as a business airline. Mm -hmm. um, Times, depending on where one is in the country, uh, if you're f to the West Coast, you view us as a business airline because uh, we have a lot of business routes out there. To, more towards the East, you'll view us more as a leisure airline. It's just a consequence of kind of where our growth path took us when and what airports we were able to get into. Um, and so as we uh, uh, grew up, we still maintained a decent amount of, uh, of business traffic. And so uh, as we saw what we had done with our direct distribution strategy over the years, we saw that we were leaving money on the table and so we needed to uh, kind of professionalize and change our corporate sales focus so that we could uh, kind of meet the customer where they were. And so we set up a, 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 an initiative which involved, you know, more headcount, uh, technology investments and, and new uh, procedures to be able to tap into the corporate market, especially for the largest corporations pre-pandemic. And uh, since it was, we saw an opportunity even post-pandemic, uh, we continued that investment in, in that work. How, how long ago did that start, Andrew? Did that involved? started about... Pardon me. Is that sort of about three or four years ago? Uh, uh, Dave Harvey, who's our uh, vice president of Southwest Business, um, he's been a Mister Fix It in a lot of different areas of the company, and so we we put him in charge of this and said, uh, take what was there, which was quite successful, but it kind of reached it, its level of of peak performance given the investment we put into it. We wanted him to bring it to the next level, and so he set about you know surveying the marketplace, talking to our customers, and then came forward with a proposal for investment uh, for people and resources and, and, and technology. Uh, to, to execute on that. And he's been doing that for a couple of years now. We've been really pleased with it. Terrific. Um, can you talk about how your expanded partnership with Sabre fits into that, if, if it does? Yeah, so um, we've been doing business with Sabre for a while um, and across multiple different uh, product lines. And we had a, kind of a basic participation in their, in their GDS, um, which uh, served some purpose, but it created a lot of friction. We, we felt like that uh, uh, for the largest corporations, Travel is kind of um, uh, one of their purchase services and they don't spend a lot of time thinking about it and they have their standard processes and, 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 uh, and technology they want to use to book travel. And since we were doing it our own way, they would only use us kind of, you know, when necessary, when there's really no other choice. And, and, and when there was choice, that we were too much of a hassle to do business with. And so what we wanted to do is work in an industry standard way. And since Sabre is the industry leader, it was a natural partnership for us to participate fully in their GDS systems. Uh, so that we could put our um, uh, our product on the shelf for the largest corporations, and uh, uh, we'll go live here, you know, not too distant future, and, and we uh, expect uh, good returns from it. So, Andrew, how has a Southwest distribution strategy changed, other than maybe the uh, advancement with uh, an increased participation with Sabre? Oh, well, that's actually a really big change for us. Uh, we've been direct to consumer for quite a long time, uh, and we were direct to to business uh, as well. And that was a point of pride and a, and a point of cost savings for us. And so this idea that we would distribute uh, indirectly through the GDS as at full participation levels uh, is a fundamental shift uh, in, our, in our distribution strategy and was really unanticipated by the marketplace. And so uh, this I think is a, uh, a big opportunity for us and for the GDSs because we're kind of going the opposite way from a lot of airlines. 
a lot of airlines distribute indirectly or in trying to push up their direct. We've already had a substantial book of business doing direct business uh, on a B2B basis, and now going towards indirect uh, is, a, is, a, is really a landmark change and counter to industry trends. Yeah, I can, under, I can see that. How do you see the distribution landscape changing over the next few years um, for both for yourself and maybe just more structurally? Well, we obviously will continue this play we have with uh, going through the GDSs and, and working uh, in a more you know, collaborative manner with the TMCs. Um, but people have been predicting, you know, you know, earthquakes in the distribution business for a while. And, and really, we see just incremental change. Um, you definitely see some more uh, technology options coming into the marketplace. Uh, and you see the uh, NDC came in with, uh, with plans for, you know, or promises for, for big changes. And really, it looks like it's led to incremental changes for uh, improvements on how to distribute, uh, you know, ancillary revenue and such. So I, I would think we would see this continued, you know, technology progress. Uh, but I don't anticipate kind of a, a fundamental shift in the in the industry in like uh, in a short period of time. Just just continuous improvement, if you will. Uh, thanks. Uh, you, you mentioned uh, uh, Dave, um, and he did an interview a while back with Hunter K, um, and he mentioned that he thought there'd be fewer TMCs in the future, but they would have increased relevance. Is 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 that your view? And if so, um, can you can you talk about that? Certainly. So what Dave was talking about, there's just two trends going on that, that lead to that answer. The first trend is that um, uh, TMCs are consolidating. We see the largest TMCs buying regional or technology-based uh, uh, TMCs. And so uh, uh, a trend of consolidation would likely continue. And that means you know fewer, larger ones, as Dave mentioned. And then as far as being more important, I think that that's a big learning we had from, from COVID. Uh, corporations count on their TMCs for duty of care, reporting, uh, cost savings and lots of different uh, um, mechanisms that are more relevant now than they were pre-COVID. So the idea that TMC would go away seems to fly in the face of uh, our recent experience uh, and the consolidation uh, which continued during, during COVID. Uh, it seems like those two trends come together today's point of view of you know, uh, fewer, bigger, more important TMCs. Yeah, thank you. Um, maybe switching gears a little bit, uh, can you talk about personalization in successful retailing and distribution and where, where that might be heading? Yeah, certainly, you know, we are a bundled carrier. And so we don't make as uh, big a use as perhaps some of our competitors do. We have a bundled product. Now we do uh, look for personalization in our communication with our, with our customers, both in uh, you know, offer management, as well as service delivery and service remediation. Um, but we only give a, a kind of handful of ancillaries uh, that customers kind of are, you know, want to buy, if you will. We don't take the approach of pulling stuff away and then reselling it back to the customer. And so therefore we're not pushing as hard for that personalization and customization as some other carriers might. But knowing that we're the outlier, that certainly is a trend for a lot of distribution is to be able to manage add-ons better than you know, was done 10 years ago. So I think that trend will continue. You'll just see us as a, as a kind of below average number of, of uh, ancillary items, but the ones we sell will be high quality and high adoption by customers. We think that ends up to a higher revenue performance at the end of the day. Terrific, thank you. Um, how, how has the COVID-19 pandemic changed your tech budget uh, generally, if it has at all? Well, certainly with all of our expenses, uh, we had to you know, manage them down very tightly during COVID, and that included uh, uh, technology. Uh, a lot of it was we, we did not start uh, efforts we had uh, not yet begun. Uh, we have a, you know, a whole host of continuous improvement type uh, uh, stuff we could kind of easily pause. But some of the more structural ones that we counted on for uh, multi-year benefits and have been underway, it was actually you know, lower cost over the horizon to keep doing them. That included uh, some work with uh, uh, ETOP, some work with our maintenance systems, uh, and our work with Sabre to, to put in place the, the, the um, uh, GDS participation that'll go live here in the near future. And so that was important to us because we had the financial wherewithal to keep to maintain that, that we not mortgage our future. And so I think that worked out well for us, but it certainly uh, depressed our tech budget during COVID. Um, and then as we evaluate coming out of COVID, we'll look and uh, as we do every year, we rack and stack and look at what we, our budget can afford and therefore what uh, initiatives will we fund for that year. That'll come up here in, in October and we'll decide you know, what we're gonna do in 2022. And I guess as part of a tech budget these days, it, you, know, you have to talk about artificial intelligence and machine learning, um, or at least many people are. Uh, would you be able to talk about how that fits in for the industry and, and how Southwest may or may not use AI and ML uh, today and in the future? 
Well, we view that as, as a tool in the toolbox of our business leaders and, and our tech leaders. And we have some departments uh, who've been using them for a while. And so it's embedded in the departments. You might think about a revenue management or marketing and uh, network planning and stuff. And then we also have a centralized resource in our strategy team provides kind of that service out to departments who are newer to that. Uh, say an accounting department that, that may not have that embedded and would like to use the central resource. Um, and that's the way we kind of roll out our continuous improvement with black belts and such. We're doing the same thing with, with AI and machine learning. We have a, a central pool of data scientists who do projects and kind of help teach departments how, how to properly use it. And so it just becomes a tool in every manager's toolbox to use the proper, uh, um, uh, the, the, the proper problem. You know, I will say that you think of any initiative uh, in our company and probably in corporate America, um, it involves a technology aspect. It's really hard to have an improvement initiative that doesn't have technology in it. Yep. And it's got technology, it's probably got AI and ML uh, these days. So this is kind of part and parcel of, of doing business. If you were thinking about the benefit of AI and ML and how to kind of put it into the revenue camp or the cost savings camp, is it 50-50? Where, where would you think that the benefit comes? Is it more on the cost side or the revenue side? And we expect managers, you know, in all areas to use it. So we have uh, examples where, you know, routine back office work um, uh, can be now done with, um, with RPA. Uh, and on the other side, we have, uh, you know, uh, our pricing and, and revenue management uh, that humans can't, you know, handle every single flight. So they need assistance from, from AI and ML to, to, to manage flights that uh, a just human can't get to. So we see, you know, across the board, um, that it provides benefits. So it's more of an expectation that every leader uh, properly use it than thinking it's just a revenue thing or cost thing. Gotcha. Um, I guess it's quite related. Um, airlines have always had lots of data, but um, it's probably more than ever. Um, how is that value of that data? Has it increased? Is AI and ML the only way that that is increasing value or is, 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 is data creating a lot of value for your company today and will it create more in the future? Uh, you know, I've been at Southwest uh, just shy of eight years. And, and when I came here, uh, I was impressed by how uh, ubiquitous and easily available data is at Southwest Airlines. So for many years, you know, uh, people uh, that came before me had the foresight uh, to begin storing the data. You know, of course, uh, technology evolves and you have to change uh, the mechanism. It was, you know, data cubes and data data warehouses and you know now they're talking data lakes and so it's you know i don't master any of that but i know the data is there and it's easily available and we use it all the time every single initiative every single kind of management question comes down to a, a data exercise and you know i can remember 15 years ago people people say well we can't get the data or we have to merge the data no one talks about the data not being available anymore now mm -hmm. they talk about statistical techniques they use to evaluate the data uh, so I think that's a huge improvement and it basically I think gives the, the, the fodder for almost anything you want to do because of that data being so good quality, such good history and, and readily available to our, to our managers and individual contributors. Terrific. Um, maybe switching gears backward a little bit. Um, can you talk about um, being actively participating in the managed corporate travel um, marketplace, how that affects uh, your cost structure or your unit costs, if at all? Yeah, well, I won't go into kind of our, anything about unit cost per se, but I will say indirect distribution is more costly than direct distribution. Uh, indirect, um, a little more costly and a more variable component to it, whereas direct distribution has more of a fixed cost component to it as we build up kind of the infrastructure for selling through our website and, and, and such and our APIs. And so it doesn't mean you don't do it. It just means it has to have the right value equation in the right circumstance. So for indirect distribution with the TMCs and through the GSs, we think it's a you know, good value and an appropriate strategy to use that to sell to corporations and uh, we're happy to do it. Terrific. Um, do you need to change your route structure at all to, to be more active in the corp managed corporate travel? We've had um, a lot of business travel, as I mentioned earlier from day one. And so we are already a business airline in many parts of the country. And so um, we don't need to uh, change it necessarily. If those particular clients or particular markets that are requested, we will certainly modify for that. But we already have you know, lots of short, medium haul, high frequency markets with convenient business traveler attributes. And so the, our approach to corporate travel is really putting more volume uh, onto what already exists there. So it's really a great operating leverage play. 
We had an investor ask a question about uh, whether your intention is to become the low fare corporate airline. Is that something how you would describe your intentions in that space? We, you know, I think of ourselves as a low fare airline, regardless of the market which we're selling. So uh, we certainly expect that our, our, our fares today, which are lower, um, and we sell to corporations and businesses outside of these, uh, these channels uh, to continue. Um, I will say that we, we've been doing business with the TMCs for quite a while. So we're already present in this marketplace. I just say underpenetrated because we didn't use uh, Sabre and others uh, to distribute. So I don't think this would you know, affect how we price in these markets. It just makes us show up on the shelf better than we did before. So the extent that, that changes price in the market, so be it. Uh, but really it's just making what we have today available on the shelf more broadly is really the, the play here. In that, um, I guess related to that, another investor question that came in was, would you consider uh, using OTAs as part of your distribution strategy? Well, our world is too dynamic uh, to, to you know, glibly use, you know, always and never. Uh, <laughs> I will say uh, at this point in time, we have no interest in OTAs. I don't see that change in the near future. Terrific. Uh, Andrew, is there anything you'd like to conclude with or uh, any other messages or should we just wrap it here? You know, I, I would say that um, I appreciate the invitation to be here and I, and I appreciate what Sabres doing in the marketplace. You know, uh, I think we've had through this a constructive relationship with Sabre. Uh, we find that valuable. It's uh, we, we hey, you know, negotiations can be tough, but we came to something that was mutually agreeable. And I think it will help both of us in the marketplace. And we're looking forward to, you know, an airline and GDS partnership and going to market together the, uh, this fall. Terrific. Thank you so much for your time, Andrew. My pleasure. Have a wonderful day.